Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. This is the city. Los Angeles, California. 200 years old, and it's still a youngster. Every month it grows a couple of inches taller and increases its chest expansion. It eats more food, uses more energy, and needs longer pants. Like other adolescents, sometimes the city has growing pains. When the pains get too severe, I'm part of the treatment. I carry a badge. It was Monday, October 15th. It was cloudy in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of a special detail of homicide division. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Hertel. My name's Friday. We had rumors of an impending war between juvenile gangs in the city. Reportedly, the gangs were well supplied with homemade weapons. We didn't know when the fighting might start. We had to try and stop it. Hi, Joe. Hi. What'd you find out? It was Dan Gardner. He's on his way over from Juvenile. He'll give us a rundown on the thing. Good. Sure is a beautiful day. Oh, you're feeling pretty good, are you? Great. Got in some studying for the sergeant's exam during my lunch hour. I am really whipping this thing, Joe. I went through the chapter on police reports. I got the whole thing down cold. Well, that's fine, boy. I'm glad to hear it. You know, Joe, you have to be absolutely factual in your reports. Factual, brief, and accurate. And that's where my newspaper training sure going to help. I didn't know you had any newspaper training. Oh, sure. Four years of it. Well, is that so? Yeah. All the way through high school. I was staff man on the school paper. Oh. Wonderful training, Joe. Nothing like it. You see, in news work, you have to be factual, brief, accurate, too. It's a must. Mm-hmm. All right, what'd you do? Write a column for the school paper? No, I didn't have a column. Well, then, were you one of the editors? No, not exactly. Would you cover sports? No, I never cared much for that end of it. Well, now, just what did you do? Well, it's a little hard to say. I guess you might say I was on the administrative side. Uh-huh. What'd you do? I used to run the mimeograph machine. Oh. Hi, Joe. Frank. Good day, Gardner. Hi, Dan. Good to see you. How are things going? Oh, not bad. A little slow. Sit down, Dan. Here, take my chair. Thanks. Well, we hear you got some problems. Oh, lots of them. Captain brief you in any of it? No, I figured you'd fill us in. Guess you could use some help, huh? All we can get. Sitting on top of a bomb, we don't know when it's going to go off. What's the pitch? Juvenile gangs. Five of them this time. We we got it, they're ready for trouble, all of them. High school kids? Most of them. Some of them junior high. Well, now, how come five gangs, Dan? What are they planning, a free-for-all? It's a long story. They've been building up to this thing for months. We hear it's supposed to be an open war. Uh-huh. Here's a list of the different gangs involved. Thanks. You can see there, same crowds we've been riding herd on for the last couple of years. Yeah. Night Prowlers, Blue Devils, Black Tigers, Green Valley, Chalk Hill, yeah. Here's the breakdown on each one of them. Hard to get exact figures, but we think it's fairly accurate. Yeah. Night Prowlers gang, 26 members. Leader, unknown. The Blue Devils, 18 members. Leader, Bertram Willis, age 16. The Black Tigers, 22 members. Leader, Robert Barson, age 17. They're supposed to be the strongest bunch. Green Valley gang, 20 members. Leader, unknown. Chalk Hill Gang, 16 members. Leader, Thomas Resnick, age 18. What's behind it, Gardner? A lot of factors enter into it, I guess. It's my own idea, the Black Tigers Gang's doing most of the promoting. What's the object? The usual big shot idea some high school kids get. Black Tigers figure they're gonna run the whole city. They've already scared the Green Valley Gang, the Blue Devils into joining up with them. Well, how'd they manage that? I'd like to find out myself. Dan, how about the other two crowds? Chalk Hill and the Night Prowlers? The story I get is they won't come in with the Black Tigers. That's supposed to be the reason for the war. 
Either they join up with the Black Tigers or they fight them. That's the warning they got. Well, I don't get it, Dan. Who's doing the organizing? Who's promoting it? I got an idea about that. I'll get to it in a minute. Take a look at these things. Samples of the different weapons the gangs are getting together for their big fight. Stupid kids, huh? Brass knuckles, homemade saps. Homemade stiletto, too, huh? Kids are supposed to have dozens of them. Another one here. Look at this. An ice pick. Anything you can think of, you name it, we got it. Hmm. It's gonna be murder if we can't find a way to stop it. You've been able to figure what the real trouble is, Dan. Yeah, a kid by the name of Robert Barson. He's supposed to be the ringleader of the Black Tigers gang. Moved in about a year ago from the Middle West. What do you know about him, Dan? I wrote a letter to the city he originally came from. Nothing but trouble back there, bad juvenile record. Well, do you think he's responsible for working up this gang war idea? We figure he's our biggest problem. We've tried everything to reach the Barson kids, settle them down. Check with the teachers at his school, the principal, the vice principal. They can't handle him. They figure on expelling him if he doesn't straighten out. Tell me, Dan, how about the other youngsters in these gangs? I mean, besides this Barson boy. We've got notifications out for them and their parents. They're supposed to be in our office tomorrow night, 7.30. Maybe we can break Barson's hold on these kids. Oh, it sure got me. What's the matter with this Barson boy's parents? Don't they know what's going on? Can't they control him? We tried to talk to the parents. They think we're wrong. They're proud of the kid. He's got a high IQ. They think he's a natural born leader. Yeah, sure. Mother says people just don't understand the boy. I'll tell you, Dan, you should have passed her the word. Huh? San Quentin's full of people that are hard to understand. <laughs> Following night, Tuesday, October 16th, the members and ringleaders of various juvenile gangs, along with their parents, showed up at Georgia Street Juvenile as requested. In questioning each of the youngsters, we definitely confirmed the reports we had of the impending gang war. A few of the parents didn't bother to show up at the meeting. Among these were the parents of 17-year-old Robert Barson, the boy who seemed to be promoting most of the trouble. The following morning, Frank and I drove out to his home and talked with his mother. I don't know why you say that. I appreciate you worrying about my boy, but I'm sure it's not as bad as you think. I don't mean to contradict you, Mrs. Barson, but I'm afraid it is. It's a lot worse than you think. That's what the other officers said, too. But you really don't have any proof, do you? I mean, a few idle rumors, you certainly can't accuse Robert on that basis. We're not accusing Robert of anything, ma'am. That's not the point. What we're trying to do is to head off the trouble before it starts. I understand, but what trouble? As I say, some boy says there's going to be a fight. He tells you Robert has something to do with it. You need more to go on than that, don't you? We've got more than some boy's word for it, Mrs. Barson. We've interviewed dozens of them. They all say the same thing. Now, we've got samples of the weapons they use, and we know who's involved. I don't mean to be unreasonable about it, Sergeant. I hope you understand that. Yes, ma'am, we do. It's just that I know my son. You see, very few people really understand Robert. Now, if there's going to be trouble with gangs in the neighborhood, as you say, I'm sure Robert hasn't anything to do with it. If he did, he'd tell me. Well, you were living in the Middle West before he came to Los Angeles, ma'am. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Nebraska. Well, now, wasn't your son involved in some kind of trouble back there? Yes, but it didn't amount to anything. It could have been avoided so easily. They just didn't understand, Robert. That was the whole trouble. Tell me, is he an only child, ma'am? Yes, just Robert. But he's not spoiled. I know it's a great temptation with an only child, but we didn't spoil him. Robert just isn't like that. Mm -hmm. You allow him quite a bit of freedom, do you, ma'am? I mean, does he go out at night very often? Well, he is 17 years old, going on 18. Yes, my husband and I allow him to go out as often as he likes, as long as he keeps up with his studies. Robert's always done very well. Do you know where he spends his time when he goes out at night? He's usually down at the gym or at the library. You know that for a fact, do you? I trust Robert, if that's what you mean. If he tells me that's where he goes, I believe him. If a mother can't believe her own son, who can she believe? Well, how about the company your boy keeps? Do you know his friends, Mrs. Barson? Few, yes. There's the Miller boy and Oscar Holland. They seem to be fine boys. Miller and Holland? Yes. There doesn't seem to be anything wrong with them. There is, ma'am. What? 
Both of them have juvenile records. Both of them belong to your son's gang. Really, Sergeant, how can you say that? It isn't fair. Wouldn't it be better to try and understand these boys instead of picking on them, persecuting them? I don't know how we're going to make you understand, Mrs. Barson. We're not picking on them. We're not persecuting them. We know there's a gang problem. We know your boy's one of those at the bottom of it. Now, if something isn't done, there's going to be trouble. If we're going to stop it before it begins, we've got to have your help. I'm perfectly willing to cooperate. You know that. That must be Bob now. Would you come in here a minute, Bob? Yeah? What do you want? These are police officers, Bobby. This is Sergeant Friday and Officer Smith, is that right? Yes, ma'am. How are you, son? Hi, Bob. Hi. How about some deep? Haven't you got anything ready yet? Well, I wasn't expecting you, Bob. Won't take a minute, though. I'll go out and get a snack together for you. Could I fix you a sandwich, officer? No, no, thank no, you. No, ma'am. Thank you. Excuse me. Well, what's this about? You want to see me or you just want to talk to my mother? Sit down here a minute, son. We'll talk to both of you as long as you're here. Well... I've got to take off pretty fast. What's it about? It's about Geronimo. That's the gang's code word for the war you're setting up, isn't it? I don't know what you're talking about. Your gang, Bob, the Black Tigers. We talked to half a dozen of them last night on a juvenile. I don't know what you're talking about. Somebody must be handing you a line. No, no, we got the names of everybody in your gang. We know the whole setup. Now, you go ahead with your idea, and you're going to buy a lot of trouble, Bob. You know, a couple cops were here last week, and they wanted to know the same thing. And I don't know any more about it now than I did then. Honest, what's the pitch, anyway? You know what the pitch is, kid. No, I don't, honest. Oh, you think I'm in a gang. Is that it? You're in it up to your neck, son. Now, why don't you come off it? We've got you pegged and everybody that runs with you. That includes the girlfriend you got in the gang. You're not fooling anybody. Well, you must be a little goofy because I'm not in any gang. In fact, I've never even heard of a gang around here. All right, now, you listen to me, boy. You can take this as a warning or a piece of advice any way you want it. You and your friends keep on playing punk gangsters, and we're going to land on you hard. You understand? What is this? You're trying to scare me. If it'll make you change your mind, yeah. Now, if this street war comes off, there's going to be big trouble. What do you think's going to happen when 200 kids tangle in a fight with knives and brass knuckles? Use your head. There you are, Bob. Glass of milk, nice bowl of hot soup, bacon and tomato sandwich. You always make this soup too hot. I'm sorry, Bob. Let it cool for a minute. Bob has to eat and hurry along, officers. Was there anything else you wanted to talk about? No, I think you've heard about everything we have to say. I wish you'd think it over, Miss Barson. You too, Bob. Nothing to think over. Mom, they're trying to say that I'm in a gang. They think that I'm the leader of a gang. Well, you told them, didn't you, son? Sure. They don't believe me. I wish I could make you understand, Sergeant. He's no gang leader. Robert's telling the truth. No, I'm afraid he's not, ma'am. But he is. I know he is. I mean, after all, he's my son. I'm in a position to know him better than you do. Yes, ma'am. If he was lying, I'd know it. A mother's the only one who really knows her boy. I know Robert's telling the truth. Aren't you, Robert? Robert? Hmm? You're telling the truth, aren't you, son? Sure. Soup's cold now, Mom. Before we left the house, we tried again to talk to Robert Barson and his mother, but it was no use. She believed every word he said and apparently refused to believe the possible consequences of the war he was planning for his gang of juveniles. We drove downtown and had an interview with the boy's father at his work. He was even less cooperative. He took a belligerent attitude, accused us of persecuting his son, and ordered us out of the office. 5.45 p.m. Dan Gardner, Frank, and I met with Captain Glavis down at Georgia Street Juvenile. Most of the parents are pretty agreeable, eh? Yes, yeah, sir. About 90 percent of them promise to make their kids get out of the gangs and stay out. If the parents mean what they say, the gangs are going to take a big drop in membership. The Barson kid and his stooges can fight it out alone. Any more rumbles about where they've got the fight set for? No, nothing for the last two days. If they figure on holding it, it'll probably come off late on a Friday afternoon. Maybe Friday night. That's when most of the trouble's been cropping up. Mm -hmm. Well, we've done all the warning and persuading we can. The next thing we move on is out in the field. You got anything in mind, Skipper? Strict curfew all over the area. We can start tonight. Well, what do you figure, just on the weekends? Every night of the week. I'll get some more men in to help out. Every youngster out on the street after 10 o'clock gets stopped. Yes, sir. 
Every one of them caught with knives, saps, brass knuckles, or anything like them. They're going to be pulled in and filed on. No exceptions. It'll be a lot safer in custody than mixing it in a gang fight. Well, might teach some of the parents a lesson anyway. Captain Glavis. Where was that? When? Yeah, right away. East Boyle Avenue, out near the cemetery. What is it? That curfew was a good idea, but we got it too late. Huh? The gang war, it's already started. Before we left the office, Captain Glavis had communications notify all J cars on the special detail to proceed at once to the scene of the major 415 call. Ten cars were ordered to cruise the area surrounding the actual scene of the fight. They were to pick up any and all members of the juvenile gangs who showed any evidence of having been in the fight or had in their possession any deadly weapon. When Captain Glavis, Dan Gardner, Frank and I arrived at the scene, the J cars and three radio cars had the area blocked off. An ambulance crew was giving emergency treatment to some of the youngsters injured during the fight. One of them had been blinded. The juveniles who had been lucky enough to escape without serious injury were removed to juvenile headquarters for further questioning. While we were talking to one of the juvenile officers at the scene of the fight, a teenage girl ran up to us and asked us to come with her. She said her boyfriend needed help badly. He's in there. It's terrible. You've got to help him. It's the Barson boy. Yeah. I'll get one of the ambulance crew. Frank, wait a minute. Huh? You better call the coroner. <laughs> The 17-year-old Barson boy was pronounced dead from the knife wounds in his chest. As we left the scene, we asked Sergeants Zachary and McTighe to notify the parents of the deceased. We called Control One and informed them that we were bringing in a teenage girl for questioning. 7.15 p.m., we got back to the office and proceeded to question the girl who identified herself as Clarice Porter, age 16. She told us she was Robert Barson's girlfriend. There was a lot of yelling and kicking and fighting going on. I ran around looking and I finally saw Bob. I'm not sure it happened so fast. What happened, Clarice? I'm not sure. Somehow Jumpy got to his feet. I thought I saw him pull a knife on Bob. Long and thin. Maybe an ice pick. Yeah. Bobby was still hitting him with the chain. Jumpy's face was all cut up. Then it looked like Jumpy hit Bob in the chest with something. Bobby stopped. Jumpy did it again. Bobby turned white. He looked sick. He started to run. What happened then? Bobby kept running. I went after him. I saw him fall. He got up. He kept running. Then one of the other gang grabbed me. They hit me. They... It's all right. We understand. I didn't find Bob until the fight was over. I heard the sirens. They were coming around from everywhere. I felt sick. I finally found Bob. He was laying on the seat of the car, just laying there. That's when you called out? I guess I knew it. As soon as I looked at him, he was dead. It's terrible when you find somebody dead. Somebody you love. It'll be all right, youngster. It won't be all right. Now take it easy, Clarice. I love Bob. Didn't you know that? When he graduated, we were going to get married. As soon as he got out of school, we'd be married. Married. <laughs> Clarice? How old are you? Sixteen. Why? Oh, nothing. It happens to practically everybody. Huh? People make a lot of mistakes when they're sixteen. 8.13 p.m. A special show-up was held and Clarice Porter identified 17-year-old Warren Stoll, nicknamed Jumpy, as the boy who'd stabbed Robert Barson to death. Half a dozen members of either gang also tabbed Stoll as the boy who'd wielded the murder weapon. Statements were taken from all concerned. All parties were detained pending a hearing in juvenile court. 8.53 p.m. Clarice Porter was turned over to a policewoman and Frank and I started questioning the subject Warren Stoll about the murder. I told you the truth. I told you the whole story. I don't have to tell you again. No, we're pretty sure you're not telling us the truth here, Warren. Now, we know you tangled with Bob Barson in that fight this afternoon. No, I didn't. Look, son, we got statements from a dozen kids. They said Barson had a chain. He kept slugging you with it. You pulled a knife and stabbed him. How do they know? A lot of kids there had knives. Anybody could have stabbed him. Why are you picking on me? No, it was your knife, son. Your initials are on it. 
I lost the knife in the fight. Somebody could have picked it up, used it. Now, that won't do, youngster. That knife's been processed. Your fingerprints are all over it. How about it, son? <laughs> all right, come on, Warren. What do you got to say? Nothing. I killed it. Warren Stoll was booked in at Georgia Street Jail on suspicion of manslaughter. We received a call from Sergeant Zachary. He informed us that no one was home at the Barson house, but according to one of the neighbors, Mrs. Barson was expected back around 11.30. 11.45 p.m., we broke the news of her son's death to Mrs. Barson as gently as we could. She immediately became hysterical, and Frank called the family doctor who prescribed the proper sedatives. Later, when she recovered herself a bit, she asked for the full story. We told her. How could it happen? Bobby, how could it happen? Oh, we're sorry, ma'am. There's nothing much we can say, but we certainly tried to stop it. But you didn't stop it. You let them kill him. We tried to warn him, ma'am. We tried to warn all of them. You didn't try. Bob's dead. He's 17 years old and he's dead. I can thank you for that. We're sorry you feel that way, ma'am. Why shouldn't I feel that way? You call yourselves policemen? That boy who killed Bobby, he should have been in jail in the first place. A young killer running around loose. You're just as guilty as he is. I'm not trying to defend the boy, ma'am, but he's not a young killer. He doesn't even have a record. I don't care anything about records. He's a killer. He took a knife and he killed Bobby. And you let him do it. You let him do it, my only baby. We better be going. Yeah. Where is he? What have they done with him? I want to see him. The coroner can tell you that, ma'am. I suggest either you or your husband call him in the morning. Oh, dear God. I suppose there'll be an inquest, too. Yes, ma'am. You'll be notified about the time and the date. I hope you have to live with this. I hope you live with it like I'll have to live with it. I hope it haunts you for the rest of your life. I know how you feel, ma'am, but you're wrong. I think you'll realize that in time. They murdered Bob. You let them do it. I'll always remember that. Well, you might remember something else, too, ma'am. The last time we were here, we tried to make you understand. You didn't know Bobby. You didn't understand him. I was the only one. I knew what he was thinking. I always knew what he was going to do. I was the only one. No, ma'am. There was someone else. What? The boy who killed him. <laughs> On April 10th, a hearing was held in the juvenile court of the state of California in and for the county of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that hearing. The subject was filed on under section 700 sub M of the Welfare and Institutions Code, charged with manslaughter, and was turned over to the State Youth Authority. Seventeen other principals involved were also filed on under section 700 sub M of the Welfare and Institutions Code, and charged with assault with a deadly weapon. Of those 17, 11 were placed on probation. The remaining six were turned over to the State Youth Authority for confinement in one of its facilities. <laughs> <laughs> 